Okay. So last time where we were is we finished up um, Just trying to do something reasonable here. There we go. Okay. Yeah, so last time we talked about scheduling and, oh, you know what? Sorry, give me one more second here. i do this, see if this still works. Okay. Gosh darn it. Oh, we're back. Cool. Okay. All right. We'll go with this. So the last time we finished up by talking about scheduling, um, and we looked at a few different techniques to schedule our memory accesses. The first one that we looked at was to optimize for row hit so we just always if we can get a row buffer hit we will service that request the thing that that led to is unfairness where we had some threads that would um, have a bunch of their requests serviced at once we saw this example with the streaming um, one up here oh dear why is the animation why are there so many of them uh, we had the streaming pr program up here that just had a bunch of sequential uh, reads, while the other program here, this random one, has a bunch of random memory accesses, which aren't going to induce very many, if any at all, uh, uh, row buffers, row buffer hits. So what happens is that our streaming program gets the priority. It'll just uh, kind of take all of the bandwidth. So what did we do? Well, we saw an animation that was way too long. And then we had this concept of uh, unfairness and kind of trying to minimize this using a new scheduling algorithm that takes into account this unfairness factor. And that is where we ended. Um, we effectively can keep track of how unfair our uh, uh, memory accesses are and kind of the, calculate a, an approximate slowdown for each of the different threads and try and equalize that slowdown and distribute it across all of the threads. Um, that allows us to. Uh, more effectively um, give each thread ability to progress. All right, any questions before we move on? Okay, so we're gonna talk about another problem that uh, happens with multi-threaded systems and memory accesses. So one thing that, that happens is that we, uh, at the CPU level, will create multiple memory requests at once and then allow the memory controller to sort of schedule those and uh, have have more things so that it can it can move them around and schedule them appropriately. Um, this is called memory level parallelism, and it you know there's a bunch of things that are uh, that contribute to this, both out of order execution, run ahead execution, all sorts of stuff like this. Um, but this is only effective if we have parallelism within our actual RAM. So we need this uh, bank, um, effectively bank level parallelism. We want to be able to access different banks in parallel. And that's going to allow us to 
um, kind of distribute the load out across multiple different banks. And that'll help us hide the CRAM latency by at least getting good throughput. Um, and obviously this is a, a team job, right? We have to have support from the DRAM controller to figure out um, which requests to make at which time. And we also need that hardware support on the other side. Now, generally, unless we're really lucky and only have like one or two threads, multiple threads are gonna be sharing the same DRAM controller. And DRAM controllers, as of yet, aren't aware of this, this uh, memory level parallelism that we actually have. So what we're going to do is we're gonna see that we're going to have to service each thread outstanding request serially and not in parallel. Uh, and this is because we, there's no real understanding of the threaded nature of these requests. So let's take a look and see what this um, looks like. So we're doing some computation with our thread and then we make two DRAM requests. This is just a single thread in this case. We aren't dealing with multiple threads at this point. Let's just say that this requests to bank zero at row one and bank one at row one. So we'll go ahead and send this request over first. Um, there's gonna be some latency just to you know, get it going. And then um, we'll then ask for, since they're in different banks and we can request to different banks uh, at the same time or, you know, you know, at one cycle after, um, they're not quite in parallel. They're 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 offset by one cycle, but it uh, it's not too much. Hello. Oh crap! Why did it? Why did it freeze? Oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, we can kind of be servicing these two since they're in two different banks. We can be servicing these two requests at the same time. Um, and for this entire time, obviously the thread has to stall and wait for memory. And then um, it'll finish. We, we have to um, incur just a little bit of extra latency because of the alternating between the two banks across the bus. But then we can go back to actually doing useful computation. Okay, so effectively we're able to hide the latency of these, these two by kind of overlapping them. And now instead of having two long latencies for reading from the bank, now we only have kind of one plus a little bit of extra. Now, what happens when we move? Um, oh yeah, oh, here we go. The, the bank latencies are overlapped. Now, what happens if we have two threads. So we're doing some computation in both threads and then they both create DRAM requests. Now, what can we do? These are our requests over here. You can see thread A, thread B, thread B, thread A, okay? And this one's to row one in, in each bank. This one's to row 99. And if we start with this thread A to bank zero and row one, we'll go ahead and send that over. Then we're going to request this bank one at row 99. So now we've done a bank zero and uh, bank one. And then 
we go ahead and service this uh, thread B bank zero row 99 request right after. Now, the reason that we have to wait and we can't overlap it in this case is because bank zero is being used by the other thread. here. So we couldn't start our bank zero request at this point because bank zero is in use. Okay, so then um, bank one is finally finished. So when we get to this request, we can service it on uh, on the uh, uh, A thread. And you'll notice that, you know, finally we'll get done with all of these requests, um, but, and, and go back to comp computing, but, uh, we now have a slowdown from uh, what we used to have, right? With the single thread, we were able to overlap these stalls. So we only had one stall period. Now on both threads, we have two times uh, the amount of stalling. And this is because it's not serial. We have to serialize it because the, the banks are being utilized by the other thread effectively. And so this is a, a problem, right? Ideally, we would rearrange these in such a way that um, maybe we can at least overlap one of these. We might have to wait on the other one, but we could overlap uh, at least one. So for example, let's make a parallelism aware schedule, scheduler where we actually are aware of these threads. And now when we do our request, we, we have the same set of requests, but uh, we're going to go ahead and, and service thread A first. So we'll do both of the requests for thread A, and then we'll finish them off. Then we'll do the, the request for, we'll start request for thread B. Notice that bank zero has become available, so we can start this request. And then we'll do the bank zero and bank one requests for thread B. So thread B is still kind of sad, right? It still has the same latency as this baseline scheduler that wasn't parallel, parallelism aware. Sorry, that's like kind of a hard word to say. But we did help thread A. So thread A has gotten a, um, gone back to what it, it was originally, where it's only stalling for one um, DRAM axis latency. Okay, there was a question here in chat. Latency can be made to appear smaller than it would otherwise. So we're effectively, with, with all of the, with doing anything in parallel, the idea is not to, the latency is always going to be the same like total, but we're trying to distribute the latency across multiple different um, threads or banks or whatever hardware that we have, whatever level of abstraction we're discussing. That's the entire point of parallel, parallelizing anything. It's kind of like, you know, you can be doing a task yourself all alone for, you know, two hours, or maybe if you have a friend, then you can each do one hour of work, you know, this is the idea. And this is the same thing here. We're trying to hide the, the latency by doing stuff in parallel. But as you saw up here, if we don't do it intelligently, we're gonna end up slowing down both threads by uh, two times, which is not good. With the parallelism aware scheduler, we're going to save some cycles on thread A. So that's always a good thing. If we save these cycles, we can do other compute here. We can do you know, all sorts of different things that are more useful than just waiting because waiting is pretty useless. So now our average stall time for these requests, instead of up here where it was, the average was two, the average is about 1.5 of our bank access latency. Okay, any questions on this? So 
can anybody think of a, a problem that might arise from, from doing this? Yeah, so, so we could, we could starve, we could starve a, a slower thread um, and kind of by favoring one of them and uh, always, you know, if they had, if, if it came in with 100 DRAM requests or, you know, uh, maybe not 100 immediately, but in fairly rapid succession, we might service those too aggressively um, and not allow B to go, go ahead and get its latency done. Okay, so we have to balance two principles with this. The first principle that we have to balance um, is parallelism awareness. So we have to be aware of this fact that we're doing requests to two different banks on the same thread. Um, so we have to schedule our requests from a thread to different banks, uh, and we need to do them back to back, okay? But as you mentioned, this is causing, going to cause starvation potentially if we have different types of memory access patterns. Uh, we could have a situation where one thread just gets all the memory bandwidth and the other threads are starved and don't get any. And the other thing that we're going to do to kind of alleviate this is we're going to batch our requests. Okay, so. Now, in addition to being, being parallelism aware, we're also going to, going to batch our memory requests and schedule them in batches. What this will do is um, we'll, we'll fix, we'll, we'll group a fixed number of our memory requests into a batch, okay? And then we'll service this batch and then move on to a new batch. What this will do is it'll help eliminate starvation because each batch is going to have some requests from each thread. And it will also allow for this parallelism awareness because within the batch, we can reorder the requests in any way we want. And that will allow us to do scheduling kind of like we did up here. So if, the, if these four requests were part of a batch, um, then we could look and see, oh, this is from the same thread, this is the, from the same thread and schedule them accordingly. Okay, so let me exit this real quick, go over here and scroll a long way. down because this has an actual animation and okay so let's look and see what this looks like in action so we have our two banks and we have a bunch of requests come in and we have uh t0 t1 t2 and t3 so we have a total of four threads now okay and what we'll do is we'll put those into a batch and we can reschedule these however we want. So let's just go with uh, T0 first. So we'll go ahead and send those over to the banks. These can be serviced in parallel and that gives us that nice overlap where we, we don't have the dual latency. We kind of only have one bank access latency, and now T0 has its data. In the meantime, what has happened is that T2 has come in with a few requests, as you see up here, but that's not going to be pulled into the same batch. So we aren't going to consider those until later on. Okay, so we've serviced T0. Let's go ahead and service the next one. Oh, here, I guess we got another request. As you can see, T2 is pretty aggressive, right? It's wanting a lot of requests but it's not going to be able to get in on this batch. It's gonna to have to wait for the next one. So T1, we go ahead and service those on both banks. As you can see, again, this is going to give us 
uh, that nice overlap of bank access latencies. Now T0 has a request, but again, it's outside the batch, so it won't be considered. T2 comes in, we do those two requests. A couple more requests come in from T1, and then we service T3 at the very end. Again, what we've done here is we've allowed for this nice little overlapping of latencies to these banks, um, which will help some of the uh, uh, the threads. Some of them will have to wait and be, you know, T3 is gonna still have to wait a while, but at least it'll be serviced eventually and it'll be serviced where we can access bank one and bank zero in parallel. Once we've done the servicing, once we service all of the requests in a single batch, then and only then can we move up to the next batch. So we would move up to this batch with the two T1s here, and then T2, T2, and then um, these, this one from T2 and this one from T0. And we would go ahead and figure out how to schedule these. And we'd likely you know, do these two requests to T2, and then maybe, uh you know maybe these two not not exact you know there, there's a bunch of different ways that we could schedule within a batch um but we're going to limit the scope of our scheduling to a batch okay okay any questions whoops All right, which thread would you choose to serve within a batch? Is it from the oldest? Great question. Um, let's see. We can kind of do whatever we want. Most likely it makes sense to do oldest first. Yeah. But you could use a technique such as where we saw the, the, the open row. If we have a row hit, service that first. That would be another scheduling option that we could make at the batch level. Um, so yeah, With, it's, within the batch, we can use any of the techniques that we've already seen. But the, the, the key addition is that we have these batches. So we aren't doing it globally. We're only doing it on a, a subset of the memory request. And that's just to help prevent the starvation thing, because starvation is bad. OK, so again, we have two main components. We have our request batching. That's just grouping these requests together um, and only considering how to schedule those, and then moving on to the next batch after we're done servicing all of them. And then we also have. Um, to deal with within batch scheduling. And this is where I was saying we, we have some leverage. Most definitely we want to use this parallelism aware part. We want to you know, take advantage of the parallelism that the um, banks are giving us, but we also have some other options as well. Okay. Let me just see here. Um, so we, we kind of, for all of our memory requests, we sort of need to, to mark which ones um, we, we, uh, are going to be in our batch. And effectively, we're going to look at all the requests that we have and 
for each thread, we'll go ahead and find which ones are the oldest. And we'll mark those as being included in our batch. Any of, our, of the marked requests are considered to be part of the batch and can be rescheduled as necessary. Okay, so we're also going to limit the number of uh, requests per um, bank for each thread. So in the example above, right, if, if T2 had just sent in like 20 requests, maybe we would only allow it to have four of those requests or two of those requests per bank included in, in the batch. That way then we have some fairness and we allow the other threads to get in their requests and we don't have one thread just overwhelming the system. Once we've dealt with all of our marked requests, then we move up to the new batch. We figure out, we, we do the whole, we go and traverse the entire request list effectively and, and mark the ones that we want to handle. Um, okay. One thing that is key, again, is that we don't reorder across batches. You know, even if the one thread just sends in a ton of uh, requests, we're not going to consider those requests because we're only looking at our individual batch. And this comes to uh, the question that was uh, in chat. How do we prioritize requests within a batch? And to this, we can, we can use anything that we want. We can use any of the techniques that we've seen before. And I have to wait for the Zoom to update the screen. There we go. Oh, never mind. There we go. So within our batch, we can use any of these DRAM scheduling policies that we've seen. We can use um, row hit first and oldest first, to exploit low, uh, row buffer locality, that's one option. Um, but, you know, the entire point of this batching was to preserve uh, our our bank level parallelism between between threads. So we're going to also want to service thread requests back to back. Um, and the way that we're going to do this is by computing a ranking of threads. Well, and then we will go ahead and obviously when we have a ranking, we'll go ahead and sort our requests according to that ranking. Higher ranked threads are going to pr be prioritized over the lower ranked ones. And this is going to help increase the likelihood that requests from a thread are serviced in parallel by different banks. So how, do, how exactly does this uh, uh, does this work? Well, Let's go back up to our example up here. And let's just say that our sort is just on thread number, okay? So on, in this example, it's really convenient. If we sorted the request for each bank according to thread number where we, we, we service T0 first, what we would get is T0, T1, T2, T3 as our order. We would get the same order over here and then as we send the requests individually per bank, they're going to be serviced sequentially, like in parallel for the same thread. So we're going to get nice overlapping um, uh, on all of these all of these threads. Now, obviously, for the second batch, we're going to be it's going to be a little bit uh, less nice um, because you know we're going to probably service maybe T0 along with a T1, and then um, we would then service T2 together though. So we would get a, get a, be in a better position because we at least service uh, T2 um, in parallel.
the reason that um, I guess one one critical thing is we have to obviously prioritize our threads. Our sorts have to be the same for each bank. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Um, if we had different prioritizations on different banks, then we would definitely not have good interleaving of our uh, RAM requests. OK. Any questions on this within batch scheduling or on this uh, um, just request batching in general? Um, okay, we're actually going to skip how to rank the threads within a batch, and we'll we'll uh, because I, honestly, uh, well, a I'm not going to test you on it, and b uh, we kind of need to make up some time, so I'm going to skip down to this last topic of RAM. And I encourage you, if you are interested in learning more about DRAM scheduling, to go ahead and, and read those slides and kind of uh, you can ask any questions that you want about it. But as I said, it's not something that I will test you on. Um, so I do want to cover this because this is a very important topic, and that's DRAM refresh. So. What is DRAM refresh? DRAM is annoying because the, the capacitors that are holding the charges that hold the actual data will only hold it for a certain amount of time. That's kind of unfortunate, right? We, we can only leave uh, our data in a row for probably you know a, a hundred or so nanoseconds. And at that point, then you know we will have to pull it out of the row and then rewrite it back in so that the charge goes back up to a level that we can actually read out of it uh, later on. So that's not so cool, right? We, we don't like the fact that we have to um, recharge our lines constantly. And we have to do this across the entire, uh, across every single row, every single bank, every single chip all across our DRAM. So there's a few ways of doing this. One way is that we just batch all of our refreshes at once. So we just go ahead and just stop all requests, take the time and go through all of our rows, refresh them. Again, that refresh involves uh, basically read, pulling them out, re reading them, and then writing them back and kind of refreshing their charge. But the problem with this is that we have to actually stop request handling. So we can't even service any requests while this is going on. And that's less than ideal. So we can distribute them out, uh, like here, where we will refresh, let's just say, all of the um, row zero in every single bank. And we'll just go ahead and refresh all of those at time, let's just say zero nanoseconds. At time 10 nanoseconds, we'll go ahead and refresh row two, et cetera, or row, zero, row one. I don't know what indexing system I'm using, but you get the idea. We can kind of stagger, distribute out our refreshes as we go. So does this have an impact on energy usage? Um, not, necess not really necessarily. Um, I think that the, you know, um, we still have to use the same amount of energy. It's just now distributed out across a larger period of time. 
Okay. What happens? How, how does this refresh happen? Well, um, a batch of rows are periodically refreshed um, via this auto refresh command. So, so we'll just continually re refresh um, our rows. Now, the DRAM controller can, can specify which rows need to be refreshed. Like if there's no actual data there, it can skip those. Now, does this affect performance? Um, yeah, it does. Um, it affects it quite significantly, and we spend a lot of time actually doing this refresh. So is there a way to avoid this? Can we, can we do something to avoid having to refresh as often and spend as much time and um, use as much power to do this? Um, so here's both performance and energy overheads. As you can see, it's, it's pretty, pretty bad. So today, the problem is that most rows or every row is refreshed at the same rate. So we might refresh this batch of rows every 60 nanoseconds and refresh this other one every 60 nanoseconds as well, meaning that they're all at the same cadence, right? That's, um, but if we actually look at the failure probability, because basically that's what it is, right? We want to keep it charged so we have a very low probability of some bit flip, a, a failure in our memory. And what we notice, and I, sorry, I keep saying nanoseconds. I, I, I meant milliseconds. Apologies. Um, it, what we'll notice is that a lot of times our cells are, are actually not failing uh nearly as quickly as we are refreshing okay so a lot of our cells are going to be you know they can hold their charge for a long time um we're we're getting less than a thousand cell cell failures all the way up to uh 256 milliseconds for a refresh cycle now obviously there are some that are pretty bad and you know it's going to it's going to, um, um, and those 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 cells are going to be more likely to fail and cause problems. But on the whole, you know, we're kind of optimizing for the worst case scenario, even though most of the cells aren't going to lose their charge and and cause a failure um, nearly as quickly as as is the worst case scenario. Fundamentally, the problem is that we don't have any support for different refresh rates per row. Some rows may just kind of be bad and we're gonna to have to refresh them a lot. Some rows are gonna be perfectly fine and we won't have to refresh those nearly as often. Um, but again, if we just can use our conventional refresh we're going to have to refresh all of them, assuming that worst row scenario. So any ideas of how we could potentially kind of get around this? Other, other options that we could, could uh, potentially try? So we need to know good versus bad rows. Yep. And are the refreshers taking up cycles? So they're taking up IO cycles. They're causing us to not be able, like if a row is being refreshed, we can't service any requests to that row at the time. So yeah, 
Um, Amelia ha uh, had a had a good good suggestion. Let's let's know which ones are good versus bad. Another way of saying this, and maybe a little more granular uh, idea, is that we can identify the retention time of each of the rows, and then refresh each row at the frequency that needs to be refreshed. So a lot of our uh, rows are going to be fine. They don't have to be refreshed every 60 milliseconds. Uh, they only have to be refreshed every 250 milliseconds or something like that. So let's go ahead and kind of bin our rows according to their minimum retention time. And then we'll refresh the rows uh, uh, at the refresh rate that is specified by the bin. So some of our rows will be refreshed at this just 60 millisecond interval because they're they're more likely to fail. Some of them are going to be perfectly fine, um, and we will just go ahead and and allow them to uh, be refreshed at a, a slower rate. So we might have a bin for you know 64 to 128 milliseconds, another for 128 to 256. Um, And the key observation here is that you're going to find that only a few rows are going to be need to be refreshed frequently. Only a few of them are actually going to be kind of bad and have to be refreshed, you know, at the 60-ish milliseconds interval. A lot of them are going to be in these other buckets. Okay. Um, I don't know what happened here with these these little icons. That's not supposed to be a male icon supposed to be an arrow, but let's ignore that. Um, since we're only refreshing a few items, we're going to have lesser hardware overhead to achieve the number of refresh operations that we need to, to maintain our, our memory. What determines the length of the retention time? So I don't know. I I think it may be manufacturer like testing. But let me add a note. Oh, and also there's a, there have been a few questions in lecture that I said I would get back to you. I have those notes. I, I will get back to you. It's just been crazy the last week or so. Um, okay. Oh, and here's here's the paper that you can uh, you can reference that kind of describes this whole approach where we where we bin our um, our rows by their retention times. Okay. Any other questions? These are great questions by the way. Sorry I don't have an answer to you right now. Um, any other questions on RAM refresh or anything that we've talked about with DRAM? Okay, cool. Oh man, I am looking forward to not having to deal with two classrooms. I love you, Zoom, don't get me wrong, but like, it's still a pain in the butt. Um, I'm glad that you guys are actually engaging on Zoom. That does help quite significantly on my side to feel like, like I'm not just doing doing this whole Zoom management for not. Um, so I, I do appreciate you guys a lot. Um, all right, so we're gonna hop into the next topic here. 
Oh, I guess I don't have a lecture number on this slide deck. I'll add one. Um, so we're going to talk about vector processing and SIMD. OK, so what is SIMD? Well, SIMD comes from this uh, Flynn's, Flynn's taxonomy of, com uh, of, of computers. Um, and he wrote this paper back a long time ago in 1966 that classified computers into four different categories. The first category is SIFD. Okay, so this means single instruction, single data. So we have a single instruction and it's operating on a single bit of data. And so we, we're kind of, this is a single thread. There's no real like um, um, multiple threads or anything like this. We're doing a, one instruction on one data element. I mean, obviously, you know, some operations are on registers or whatever that aren't really on memory or uh, in, uh, per se, but it's still just one element that we're sending into our CPU. Okay. Some of them are branch operations as well, but let's just think about data operations. The next category is SIMD. Okay, so this, so, okay, the first two letters of all these are the, the number, kind of the instruction side of things. So single instruction, these ones are multiple instructions. And then the second two letters indicate whether or not it's uh, single or multiple data streams. And with SIMD, we still have the same single instruction part. So it's a, the same one instruction, but it's operating on multiple different data elements. And this is what we're going to be talking about. This, in, this is, there's multiple different types, one of, one of which is the array processor, the other one, the vector processor. There's a few other uh, things in the ta taxonomy as well. Uh, we have multiple instruction single data, which isn't very common because most of the time, you know, if you have a single data element that a bunch of uh, different instructions are trying to operate on, that normally isn't a good idea um, as far as, uh, you know, contention for resources and, you know, everyone wanting to write to the same place or anything like that. So we don't see that, I don't know if at all, honestly. Um, but we also are going to look at, and this is, this is going to be the, the um, I guess, next week uh, that we'll get into, uh, this MIMD. Okay, so this is multiple instructions, multiple data. So we have different, we have one core that's doing a bunch of, um, uh, one set of instructions, a different core is doing an entirely different set of instructions, and they have entirely different sets of data as well. Um, and we'll get into this with both multiprocessor and multi threaded processors later on. One way to think about these is in terms of instruction streams and data streams as well. Um, that might be a, a more useful way of thinking about it rather than thinking about the actual instructions and the actual bits of data. If you have a single, if you can kind of write down a single list of instructions that you're operating on and then kind of write down your list of memory addresses or registers that you're operating on, that's going to fall into this single instruction, single data category. If you are, if you have this list of instructions, but then you also, for each instruction, have a set of data elements to uh, operate on, that's going to be in the SIMD category. So we've seen SysD already. This is kind of what we've, we've already uh, looked at. 
Now we're going to look at SIMD. Later, we'll look at MIMD. Okay. So the key is that we're going to be able to um, create some con concurrency uh, by performing the same operation on different pieces of data. That's what SIMD is. We're, we're taking a single instruction and we're operating on multiple pieces of data at once. An example of where this might be really useful is if we're trying to do a dot product of two vectors. A dot product involves you know, doing multiplication across uh, kind of pairwise across two different vectors. And that's the same operation more or less. There's a bit of variance in like the indices, but uh, at the end of the day, it's all just a multiplication. And um, we can do that all in parallel. It's the same exact instruction. We just have to um, uh, uh, change the, the data that the instructions are operating on. This is um, different from our data flow um, parallelism. So this is where we can operate, do different operations in parallel. Um, this is, you know, we can do this in a data-driven manner, but we aren't doing, uh, we're kind of taking two different streams, uh, two different sides of a, of a branch or something along these lines. Um, two different sides of a abstract syntax tree, if you will. So what do we get with SIMD? The key is that we're going to be operating on multiple data elements. We can do this across time or space. Um, and like I said, the key is that we're also doing it, uh, doing a one singular instruction. We aren't doing any, there's no variance across these data elements as to what they're being operated on or what instruction is being applied to them. The, the, co the classic example uh, in consumer technology of a SIMD processor is a GPU. GPUs are have lots of cores and they all pretty much do the same thing. And uh, this is great because the computations that you have to do for something like rendering a scene involves the same math over and over and over again for each pixel. And so the SIMD idea where we have our data, say that the data is just our scene, uh, and then we just have to apply some transformations to that data and send it out to our screen, that's a very uh, defined process. We can do these single instructions on all of our different pixels at once, if you will. Okay, so I mentioned that we can operate um, uh, on multiple data elements, both across time and across space. So an array processor is this time idea. So we're going to operate on multiple data elements at the same time. The idea here is they would kind of be going through uh, the pipeline, if you will, uh, uh, together in parallel. Vector processors, on the other hand, operate on multiple data elements in uh, consecutive time steps. So this is gonna feel a lot more like what we've already seen with pipelining, but there's a bit of additional caveat, mainly in that uh, we don't have to worry about dependencies, especially branch dependencies with these vector operations, um, because we're, we're guaranteed, you know, that's the, the, the point of these vector operations is that we kind of define that this whole set of data is going to be 
uh, a, um, uh, a uh, th this whole set of data will have the same instruction applied uh, to it. Okay. So let's look at an array processor and a vector processor on this set of instructions. So this VR thing is a vector register. So this is gonna hold multiple elements of our array at once. And you can kind of see um, we're pulling in, uh, looks like four different elements from our array into this register. And then this add is going to operate on the register, you know, uh, where, where, where there's multiple elements in our register. So we're going to be able to uh, operate on four of the four elements at once. And then we, you know, do this multiplication and then we store that back to our array. So in an array processor, what we will do is we'll, uh, perform the same operation at the same time. So we're doing all of our loads at the same time. But uh, kind of like separate pipelines, um, each of these processing units is going to be doing a different thing um, at uh, at different points in, in, in time. Okay, so we, we effectively have now in this array processor, you can kind of think of it as just um, a little bit, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like if you have multiple cores, except for it's still the same core. Um, but now we're just able to uh, do these these operations um, all at the same time. This is in contrast to vector processors. Where we kind of have the same pipeline idea that we've already seen, which makes it so that we are doing different operations that at, uh, at different times. So each part of our pipeline is, is full, um, but we're doing the, the, the same operation across uh, multiple different uh, bits of data, right? So we're loading all of our data in kind of one uh, area, and then we're, we're passing that uh, over, um, through our pipeline. Now, as I said, this should look fairly familiar and hopefully it, it looks something like what, what uh, some, it should remind you at least of pipelining um, because it, it is, but like I said, the, the big key here is that we're able to avoid any dependencies and you know, this load instruction um, uh, will never have a um, depend like this load in load one won't ever have any uh, dependency on this load zero, for example. All right. Sorry, I guess these boxes are kind of a little bit unclear. Let me. Find the I think there's an animation with these. Oh, no, okay. Basically, the way to read these is that so. 
she also has the same off at the same time. That corresponds to this red box because it's it, we have time on this axis space across this one. So it's signifying that um, we're doing the same operation at the same time in the ray processor, and then we're moving on um, and doing uh, a different operation now. Um, but we're using the same sort of space, the same processing unit. Um, does that does that clarify? Does that mean an array processor is better than a vector processor? Well, the problem with an array processor would be that we we do have to we're probably going to have since these since these operations have to be um, uh, kind of in the same uh, we, we we have to have a bunch of different processors effectively we have to have multiple different parallel um, stream which is maybe good maybe bad it, it it could potentially be wasteful if we can't take advantage of these instructions. Does that does that make sense? Right. So so all of this is requiring more hardware support. Um, and that's it's always a trade-off, right? Um, array processors, you know, if you can't take advantage of these different instructions uh, that Gives you you know abilities to do uh, operations on vectors, then you're going to have lower utilization than is ideal. Um, but as you said, if you can saturate your processor, uh, then then that this is potentially a really good option. Okay. Um, cool. Okay, so here's an example where we're kind of um, uh, executing this same uh, instruction where we're doing this add um, across our entire vector. And then up here is we're kind of, we, we kind of have this idea where we have this uh, uh, sequence of instructions that we're doing. Um, and then we're sending, and all of our processors are effectively doing the same exact sequence. Okay. And I don't remember which one's which. I'll look that up. Um, which, uh, which one's array processing, which is the uh, LIW. Okay. So let's talk about vector processors. Um, a vector is just the same vector that you're used to. It's just a one dimensional array of numbers. We just have this list effectively. And the key is that a lot of our uh, programs involve doing loops across vectors. So here's an example we have a for loop which is uh, going from i of 0 to uh, less than or equal to 49. And along the way, we are 
um, adding two vectors together, then dividing them by two and assigning them over to C. Now, if you were in a SISD environment where we're only able to operate at, on one element at a time, what would happen? Well, we just do the A of zero plus B of zero divided by two, and then put that into C of zero. Then we'd go on to the next one and we do A of one plus B of one divided by two. And we'd have a lot of instructions just doing this iteration. A vector processor allows us to operate on the entire vector or at least a subset of the vector um, at once. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and for example, do um, A of zero plus B of zero divided by two, all at, in addition to A of one plus B of one divided by two. And we can, you know, that depending on hardware support, that'll tell us how, how many we can do at once but we'll be doing all of those operations at the same time, okay? To do this, and this is, this is why, you know, the, this is expensive, we're going to have extra hard, we're gonna need extra hardware support. We need to be able to load and store these vectors. So if we're gonna, to load them, we also need registers for them, and that uh, involves these these vector register ideas. That's this VR thing up here that I that I mentioned. Um, so now we're able to store a set of data to operate on. Again, this is going to require hardware support. We also are going to need to be able to operate on vectors of different lengths. Uh, so, ideally, you know, for, for full utilization, our, our vector would be the size of our vector register. So, if the vector register is four, we would also be uh, operating on all four elements. But that's not necessarily the case, especially if we, you know, our for loop isn't uh, um, uh, like a multiple of our vector size. And we also are gonna to need to be able to stride our, uh, the data that we put into our vector registers. Okay, so for example, in this case, it's pretty easy. There's you know, they're just integers, it's gonna be plus four. But if we, for example, were doing I and then, um, you know, if this was a like zero, two, four, like doing all of the even numbers of this array, then we could use a vector stride register to tell us how far apart different elements of our vector are. Uh, another case that this, uh, another example of this would be if we have a struct where say that we have some data um, in the first element of our struct, but then some other data that isn't necessary for this exact computation, we would wanna skip over that part of that, that struct and move to the actual data. And that's where our stride register comes in, okay? So on consecutive cycles, uh, in, in each, each consecutive cycle, what we're gonna see is that the vector instruction is performing an operation on each element, okay? So these vector functional units are pipelined. Again, like I mentioned, this is, uh, should feel similar to pipelining that we've already seen, but a, a little bit higher level. Um, and then each pipeline stage is going to also operate on a different data element. Um, so we kind of saw that up here. 
each pipeline stage is on a different element. Oh, I went too far. A few niceties. First of all, uh, vector instructions allow for deeper pipelines. The reason for this is that um, there's no intra vector dependency and there's no control flow within a vector. So, uh, you know, we aren't ever going to have to worry about, oh, shoot, is there going to be a branch? misprediction penalty no because it's a vector you're guaranteed to be doing this operation on this set of data you also aren't going to have the need for for example uh to access um uh you know we, something that wouldn't work for example is if uh, all of these relied on the previous one in addition to the next one. Uh, that would be a problem, right? If we were relying on the data that is adjacent um, to I in each one of these arrays, then we would have some problems using this uh, vector processor. But um, vector processors are assuming that that's not the case, uh, and the instructions are such that, you know, we aren't able to do that. Another advantage uh, with these vector instructions is because of the stride, we're able to prefetch accurately. Um, so think of this and pretend it has a stride, we would know and be able to accurately predict that stride for as long as this for loop is going. That gives us prefetch. Uh, abilities and when we prefetch, then we're very happy because the data is there and we don't have any cash miss penalties. Okay, uh, we're at time, so you're dismissed. I will stick around for any last questions. Um, worksheet 11 is due Friday and the paper summary uh, is also due on Friday. I think that's it. Yeah. And uh, project project three and homework four are available. So. So the worksheets, like just as, if just assume full credit on them, pretty much. I will try and give you feedback, but it's been pretty busy. Homework two. Uh, I'm going to try and get those graded this weekend. Um, yeah. Oh, re regrade requests on the exam. I apologize for not getting to them. I'll get to them. I have a lot to do this weekend. I'll probably do them this weekend. Um, and oh yeah, project four is due on basically I think that day or something. I think I made it to do Pro, uh, project three. Sorry, homework four is due in like the week before. So I think you should have a lot of time for those. Oh, Fridays, E days. Okay, it'll be due on Monday. <laughs> the the paper uh, review. Yeah, I'll make that due Monday. I forgot it's E days. Uh, Wyatt, the the paper is. Oh, now it's my computer's freezing. Zoom isn't very kind to the CPU. Give me a second. Let me pull it up. Okay. Oh. Here. 
I'll just click. I'll, I'll just. So if you go down here, here's the PDF and um, DOI. And then uh, if you go to grade scope, and there's this real hammer summary assignment that um, uh, it, it also has a description of, of what you need to do. I'll, I'll send this out in an email today or tomorrow. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah, let me um I'll make a note of that. All right, thank you everyone.